Jerome Powell, the Federal Reserve Chairman, indicates rate cuts are ahead. The time has come. The moment everybody's been waiting on for two and a half years now at this point in time, it is now officially here, folks. The front page of CNBC here today, the stock market is already starting to make major moves based upon this. The Russell today significantly outperforming the other stock market indexes by a large margin. Now, if we look at when the, uh, let's call it the market's begun to understand that the Federal Reserve was going to have to start raising. That was at the end of 2021. And if we look since that time, the Russell 2000 has actually gone down since that time. Well, the S&P 500 has gone up about 18% and the NASDAQ's up about 20%. Now, something fascinating about that is when you think about the past 33 months, everything out there has basically gotten immensely more expensive over the past 33 months. But you know what has not? The Russell 2000 over those 33 months, that's fascinating to see that. We see here today, many of my best stocks are those small cap stocks. Cheesecake Factory, 5% plus move. Fubo, about a 5% move here today. Honest, about a 5% move here today. Now, a lot of people are running to different conclusions out there. Some folks are saying, now that the Fed says rate, rate cuts are coming, this means the crash is coming. Because if we look back at some old data, we're going to find usually many times when the Federal Reserve starts cutting rates, it means a stock market crash is coming, an economic crash is coming. Okay, So we need to dive into that. Other folks are saying, you know what? I've seen many time periods in the past. This means risk on. This market's about to go beast mode. You need to be fully invested as much as possible in this market. right? And so what I want to do here today is I want to go very in-depth on what you need to do with your money, given that the federal is now flipping the other way. And I want to take you very in depth and show you past cycles. We're going to go extremely in depth. This is a type of comprehensive video that I'm going to see the only one that puts out this level of comprehensive videos on YouTube. I know what everybody else is putting on out there. And uh, this is the highest level. Now I realize there's going to be some people that don't like these sorts of videos this in depth, right? And that's perfectly fine. There's plenty of other creators out there. You can go watch 10, 15 minute videos and they'll just tell you uh, it's all doomsday or it's all great, right? And they're flipping all over the place. You can go watch those folks or you can stay with me and we can go a little higher level here and we can go more comprehensive than anybody's willing to go out there. You pick and choose. You have your own decisions in life. I appreciate y'all joining me as always. And uh, man, very excited. My front fountain area did get finished yesterday. Here's a couple pictures of it uh, from my new entry of my house here. And so just uh, I'm really happy with the work those guys put in, man. They put in a lot of dang work to that. So by the way, if you guys ever want me to do like a full house tour, because I've been doing a lot of work around the house, uh, let me know. I can do a house tour. Let me know in the comment section. If I see enough people would be interested in something like me doing a full on house tour, I'll do one maybe next month or something like that. It's up to you guys if you're interested in something like that. Alrighty guys. Now, before we get into all this, I got something that is going to blow your mind. I wanted to show you guys this because this is fascinating. Look what I found back in 2018. I was, I was scrolling my Instagram page like way down toward the bottom the other night, just like, I don't know, it was some, something to do, I guess. And uh, I found this way back in the first half. It was kind of like spring 2018. And I would posted, I said, very rare day when every single stock I own is up. Great day for pretty much uh, everything, right? And so these were my biggest positions uh, in the stocks I owned back then. L Brands, Toll Brothers, Eli, Cruzy Doozy, Apple, Goldman Sachs, and eBay. And I was like, I was kind of fascinated by that. And I was like, what are those stocks at today? Like, what if I had just stayed invested in all those? And so it looks like the only stock that did bad over that amount of time was uh, Eli, which ended up becoming Maud, uh as far as their ticker symbol. That looks like the only one that did bad. And everything else did tremendous. L Brands ended up getting broken up. They own Victoria's Secret Bath and Body Works. Those companies ended up getting broken up. So that one gets a little confusing because it's like shares got split off. That one used to be a huge dividend payer, but I would guess that was probably a money maker as well. But Apple did a four to one split in 2020. So their true stock price now is like $900 versus at that time it was in the 180s, right? Toll Brothers went from $40 to $140. Cruzy Doozy went from 38 to 142. Goldman Sachs went from 238 to 496, and eBay went from 38 dollars to 58 dollars. So, man, even that portfolio would have done pretty dang decent over the past few years, right? Alrighty, guys, let's start diving in here. So, past 20 years. What conclusions can we draw from this? Okay, this is looking at the past 20 years of the federal funds rate. 
One conclusion we can draw here is we're the highest we've been. That's just factually over the past 20 years, right? Over the past two decades. Two, we've been high for pretty long now at this point in time. If we look at how long we usually stay at a very elevated place, we're up there now at this point in time. We're pretty much, you know, a about as long as we were in the great financial crisis is about how long we're going to be up here now, right? But we're a little higher than we were at the great financial crisis prior to that time, right? And we're looking at likely a multi-year cut cycle. So that's an important thing people got to understand is this is likely going to be a cut cycle that starts in 2024 and it might not end until like 2026. So it's just a little food for thought in regards to that. Okay, so this probably has quite a ways to go. And we really only had three hike cycles over that span. We had this one prior to the great financial crisis. We had this one, which was kind of, you know, it started way back in kind of 2015, 16, and then ran through until about 2019. And then we had this recent one, right? And obviously this one was because inflation went completely out of control. This was an inflation problem as well, but it wasn't this severe of an inflation problem. No. The important thing you got to understand when we look back at these different hike cycles or cut cycles is whenever the Fed is moving by 25 basis points, picture it kind of like a cat, okay? You ever see a cat kind of like, let's say there's like a, a bunch of boxes over in an area, right? A bunch of tall boxes. A cat might kind of like touch it, like make sure is it okay, right? Test in the water. It's like, okay, can I probably make this jump and these boxes are going to stay up, right? 50 basis point move for the Federal Reserve is kind of like the cat actually jumping. And it's like, this is what I'm doing. This is where we're going. Like, this is clear our direction. We're not testing the waters anymore. This is the direction we go. 75 basis points or more in terms of Fed raising rates or dropping rates, that's panic mode. So picture the cat jumped on the boxes and then it's like, all these boxes aren't stable and it jumps off and it's panicking, right? That's the Fed whenever they make a 75 basis point move, okay? So always keep that little kind of, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, illustration I just put in your head there. Remember that for the Fed when you're thinking about 25 versus 50 versus 75 or more. So in regards to the latest rate hike cycle, this was pure panic. They, they started out by testing the waters, right? March 2022, they tested the waters, 25 basis points. Then they're like, okay, let's definitively make sure we're moving in a direction. They make a 50 basis point move, right? Like, this is the way we're going, we're hiking. And then they start panicking. 75, 75, 75, 75. When you make that many 75 basis point moves in a row, back to back to back to back, you're in full-scale panic mode as a Federal Reserve. And it makes sense that they were in panic mode. They did not start raising rates nearly fast enough, right? And they didn't start raising them early enough. They should have been raising rates already in 2021. You know, you're already seeing plenty of signs of inflation was an actual issue in 2021. They should have started raising in 2021. And then they could have kept that going in 2022. And we probably wouldn't have had to face as problematic inflation as we did end up facing in the end, right? Now, if we look at the kind of 2015 to 2018 cycle, this is what you would want to look at if you want to look at it like an orderly perfect cycle. 25 basis points up, 25, 25, 25, 25, 25. Like that was a very natural, orderly, perfect cycle. The Fed didn't have to freak out in there. We had a strong economy during that particular time, right? Along with no real inflation problems, right? And you're always going to have inflation in the economy. That's what you should have, right? If you have deflation, that means you're already in massive recession. You should always have inflation in the economy. And we certainly had that from 2015 to 2018, but it wasn't out of control. It was controllable inflation. The, the sort of inflation the Federal Reserve likes, the sort of inflation the government likes, the sort of inflation that corporations like, right? And we had a strong economy during those particular years. And so it was an orderly, perfect cycle. Then right? We had the Fed test the waters a little bit. And we actually had an orderly cut cycle, 25 basis points down, 25 basis points down, 25 basis points down. That was all orderly. And then we had a black swan event come, a once in a hundred year health event, right? And the Fed had a panic and they cut all the way back down to zero. During that situation, they took down 50 basis points. And then literally not even two weeks later, they cut by a hundred basis points. That is pure panic, right? Then we had the, uh, this was the, uh, the rate cut cycle in the great financial crisis. Now, it's important to understand the Fed was clear rate right from the go, like we're, we're cutting, we're moving here. But then they started to back off and they started doing, you know, kind of what would be seen as like very Tesla water type cuts. 
25 basis points in October, 25 basis points in December. Why are you going to move 50 and then just start moving 25? That seems kind of like babyish, right? And I believe at that time what they were scared of is some commodities were starting to jump back up during that particular time. And I believe that led the Fed to kind of be a little concerned about maybe let's not lower rates too fast because we don't want commodities to go, go, go crazy and commodities ended up still going crazy in 2008, right? Now, the important thing to understand about this, this could happen. This could happen in this cycle where let's say the Fed starts lowering rates, okay, you could send the commodities market upward in a significant way once the, after the Fed start, starts actually cutting rates. And if commodities all of a sudden start going through a bull cycle, right, imagine oil starts going up big, natural gas starts going up big, right, lumber, coffee, everything, right, boom, 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 boom. That could freak the Fed out big time because then they say, oh my gosh, like inflation might come back 6, 12 months from now because these commodities are all going up so much and we might stick ourselves in a situation where we're going to have to stop cutting rates or we might have to start going up back again on interest rates again. This is a huge risk that not a lot of people talk about or think about when they're thinking about a rate cut cycle. They assume like it's all just gravy and it's all just fine. No, if you get commodities running again, you could set yourself up for a complete disaster because then you're stuck in a situation where you could have inflation starting to run wild again while you've got a weakening economy. What do you do in that situation? Do you have to sacrifice to inflation and cut? Do you not cut and then let the economy get devastated? That's a big problem. We could run into that problem next year, folks. And I'm just mentally prepping you ahead of time. It's a potential. Okay. It is a potential. It's a risk you have to consider. Now, by the time we got to January of 2008, the Fed started to full on panic, right? They look at this January 22nd, they cut 75 basis points. 75 basis points is already a panic move, right? And then eight days later, they cut another 50 basis points. Pure panic, the Fed was at that particular moment. Then they do another panic cut of 75 basis points again, March 2008. These are sorts of things that freak a market out, by the way. You know, you might assume like, oh, the market would love this. 75 basis points, 50 basis points, 75 basis points, cuts, cuts, cuts. No, that's the type of stuff that freaks the market out. Like, oh my gosh, what's about to happen in the economy? If you, The market can deal with a Fed that's orderly and they're like going in one direction. They can deal with that. They cannot deal with a, a Fed in pure panic mode. And that's what we had at that particular time. Then it was pure panic after that, right? October 8th, 2008, they cut 50 basis points. October 29th, they cut another 50 basis points. So in a matter of three weeks span, that's 100 basis points of cuts. And then December, they cut the final 100 basis points, right? Which was just the Fed just giving up at that point in time. Like, we, we're, we, we lost it. We lost it, right? And keep in mind, when they already are making these panic cuts, they, they're already basically admitting defeat. They're already admitting they lost, right? No different than 2022, which we go back. Where's our 2022 uh, cut cycle here? Right here, this this time period, right? And we had Jackson Hole somewhere around here. This was a Fed already signaling we lost it. We lost. Like, like we're in full-scale panic mode. We lost to inflation. <laughs> we're just, you know, just trying to do whatever it takes now at this point in time. And that was the Fed certainly in, in the 2008 great, great financial crisis just on the other side of cutting. Like we lost. We're just in panic mode. Cut it down to zero. Okay? So now, important. It's very important everybody understands this. The Fed usually moves too slow at first. So it doesn't matter if it's a hike cycle, a cut cycle, they're usually going to move too slow compared to what they should be moving. So, you, you know, think about the, the hike cycle that we went through in 2022. One, the Fed should have started sooner. Two, the Fed should have went more aggressive from the go. It should have probably done 50 basis points, 50, 50, 50, 50, right? Start that at the end of 2021 rather than March of 2022. They were just way late to the game and they weren't raising fast enough, right? And that led to those panic raises of 75, 75, 75, right? So this is something important to remember. So likely, the pro the, I would say there's a pretty high probability here that when the Fed starts cutting rates, they're probably not going to do so aggressive enough. They probably should have already started cutting rates, and they're probably going to move too slow. If you're going to put the odds on it, you're usually going to have to say they're probably going to mess it up, right? It's just history. It's just history. Now, it's important to understand the Federal Reserve started cutting 2007, right? September 2007. Now, the scary part is, I mean, there's a lot of scary parts about that. When's the Fed likely going to start cutting right now? 
September 2024, okay? So another September cut into a starting of a cut cycle here, right? That's just ominous right off the bat that it's gonna be another September start to the, the cutting cycle, right? Freaky. Additionally, the recession uh, started in December 2007, right? So three months later, you got into a recession, which is kind of scary because here we are, September, Fed's going to start cutting likely, right? And could we be in a recession come December? I don't know. We'll see. But you got to remember, like, just because you start cutting doesn't mean you avoid recession. Like, you could still end up in a recession a few months down the road. Now, as of right now, the GDP is fine, Right. We're, you know, this is looking at the Atlanta GDP Now tracker, which they have us latest estimate here recently is around 2% GDP growth, which is fine, right? 2 to 3% GDP growth in the United States is, you'll take that any day. Like that's, you know, for how developed our economy is. If you can get 2 to 3% GDP growth, you're gladly take that. Like, yes, 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 let's get it. But if you think that's going to save the day and that just means all good things are here, right? The Fed's cutting, GDP looks good, we're fine. <sighs> Slow down for a second. Look at this. The third quarter of 2007, GDP growth was 2.3%. 2.3%. So you could have said right there, we're fine. GDP is growing very nice, 2% something. They're starting to cut rates. What, what's the issue? Soft landing, baby. We're here, right? Ooh, be careful jumping to conclusions. Now, you might say, okay, okay, that's something rare, right? But what we have going for us is we have a very low unemployment rate. So that means we're safe here, no problems ahead, right? Because unemployment rate is somewhere around 4.3%. Let's say it even gets worse over the next month or two, right? And let's say, you know, the September number is 4.4, 4.5. That's still very low. Anything under 5% in the United States, you'll take that. That's great low unemployment rate, right? And so you may say, we got that. We're fine. Well, guess what? August 2007, where was unemployment rate? 4.6%. So they also had very low unemployment, very low unemployment prior to the great financial crisis. So this would have been very easy to say, we're going to have a soft landing. They're starting to cut rates. We got GDP looking good. We got low unemployment, soft landing ahead, right? And then we certainly did not get a soft landing. We got a rock hard landing, right? Now, we might say, well, this time's different. And the reason it's different is we got the most ridiculous amount of money on the sideline that we've ever seen by far. $6.4 trillion, right? That's insane. Money market funds, $6.4 trillion. That's going to save us, right? Because it's so much money over there on the sideline that if the market does drop in any significant way, that money's going to come into the market. That's going to save the market. People might take money out of money market funds, buy real estate with it, and real estate goes down in any substantial way. So that's going to put a bottom on everything. And we're probably not going to get much of a move down because money markets are, are so heavy, right? So that's something you could say, but unfortunately, you have to destroy that as well. Look at they had the same phenomenon back in 2007, 2008. Money market funds were at all-time highs. All-time highs by far and away, right? And look at this. From the time I was born, right back here, we were at about $400 billion of money market funds. Guess what? By you know 2008, we were close to $4 trillion. We had 10x the amount of money market funds from the time I was born to 2008. And we still ended up having a massive crash in the real estate market, a massive crash in the stock market, and an epic crash in the economy. And we still ended up going to unemployment rates of 10-ish percent, right? Isn't that scary? That's very, very scary. Because we had all the recipes that you would have been able to make an argument back in 2007 going into 2008. Like, we're good. We got the soft landing. Fed's cutting. Money market at all-time highs. Unemployment, so low. GDP looking great. We got no problems here, right? Now, you might say, well, you know what? Our stock market. The market's a fortune teller. It looks out to the next six to nine months. It's a fortune teller. And guess what? The fortune teller says it's going to be really good. And the reason being is you look at the S&P 500, for instance, it's at all-time highs. All-time highs right now. Why would we have any sort of problem coming over the next year if the S&P 500 is at all-time highs? That means we're good, right? Well... Unfortunately, I got to take you back to, guess what? In September, October 2007, guess what? The stock market was at 
all-time highs. Yes, all-time highs back in September, October 2007, right into those rate cuts, and we still ended up having an epic crash, right? We had a we had our first initial crash, then we had to come back. People said, oh, well, that was just a little short-term, blah, blah, blah. We're fine. Then we had a much bigger dip, and then we had a nice recovery there, and people said, oh, we're going back to all-time highs. We're coming back. Then we had another massive downward move. Then we came back. People said, uh-oh, and then we went down the roller coaster straight to the bottom of the earth, right? So the moral of the story is just because the stock market's at all-time highs, it doesn't necessarily mean the stock market's going to continue to make all-time highs, you know, let's call it in November, December, January next year, those sorts of things, or even a year from now. Now, next thing you could say is, you know what, back then they had huge debt problems. We all know that. If you study anything about the great financial crisis, you know they had mortgage issues, uh, car loan issues, like debt had ran to record highs leading into the great financial crisis. Then things tipped over and guess what? You had an epic crash, you had debt problems all over the place. That hit the banks extremely hard because you've got to remember there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? They teach you that in economics 101. There's no such thing as a free lunch. If somebody can't pay their car bill, right, because they lost their job, it's a recession, whatever, right, and that car gets repoed, somebody's taking the L on that. Guess who it's going to be? It's not going to be the person that, you know, they'll take a hit on their credit. It's going to be the bank, the one that loaned the money. Now, you compound that times massive amounts of defaults on credit cards, auto loans, mortgages, foreclosures, because let's say you're in a weak economic time where unemployment keeps going up and up and up, right? And once you get those dominoes falling the bad way, it's, it's tough to stop them once they really get rolling, right? And the more substantially they get rolling, the harder and harder it is to stop, which just leads to another problem, another default. And next thing you know, you have systemic risk in the entire banking system. And next thing you know, you have other banks toppling over other banks. Next thing you know, things that were hidden away that no one really quite had seen or no one was really paying attention to those things come to light, right? I mean, who was worried about credit default swaps before the great financial crisis hit? No one. No one was talking about credit default swaps back then. And then all of a sudden, things start to go south. And all of a sudden, everybody's talking about, whoa, you see these problems in credit default swaps, right? Mortgage-backed securities? No one was talking about mortgage-backed securities prior to the great financial crisis. Next thing you know, things start going south. People talking about, well, what about these mortgage-backed security situation and the way they're bundling these mortgages together? All of a sudden, things start to come to light that weren't there before. No different than actually recently, right? No one was talking about the Japanese carry trade for the most part. All of a sudden, overnight, everybody's talking about the Japanese carry trade and what that means for the market and Japan raised their interest rates a quarter point. Oh my gosh, this means... Think about that for a moment, right? It's, it's when everything gets a little bit this way, then all of a sudden everything comes out. And everybody's like, whoa, right? It's an old saying a Warren Buffett has, something like, you never know who's swimming without their bathing suit until the tide goes out. Something like that, Warren Buffett says, right? So they had a lot of debt problems back then, right? We don't have debt problems, right? Well, we're sitting on an all-time high record amounts of debt. Yes, and this looks at housing debt, as well as non-housing related debt, and we are at all-time highs right now. If you look at the total debt balance, we're around $5 trillion more than they had back in the great financial crisis, okay? Something to factor in. Now, keep in mind, people's net worths have gone up a lot since that particular time. Additionally, wages are significantly higher than back then. That all needs to be considered as well, right? So naturally, debt should be, in theory, quite a bit higher than it was back to prior to the great financial crisis, but... You know, it still is a little worrisome that we're five trillion dollars plus more than prior to the Great Financial Crisis. A little food for thought there. What about credit cards? Well, recently there is an interesting phenomenon. Credit card debt actually went down very slightly here recently, but we're nearly two x where we were back in 2014 in terms of credit card debt numbers. So the amount of credit card debt outstanding is a very high amount right now. Which, once again, if if people you, you, there's going to be an order. Like if, if you get into really tough economic times, and I'm talking real job losses and those sorts of things, you've got to keep in mind there's like an order of importance of what people pay, right? People are going to do everything in their power to keep their cell phone bill going because the cell phone is like the most important thing to most people's lives nowadays, right? People are going to do whatever it takes to keep a, a roof over their head, right? Like they want that roof over their head. They've got to have the roof over their head, right? 
And people are going to do whatever it takes to hopefully keep the car, but that's even a lower importance than a cell phone or than a, than a house, right? To keep a roof over your head. So what are you going to let go? You're going to probably not pay, maybe buy, buy now, pay later type stuff. You might default on credit cards because you look at that and you're like, okay, whatever. Like I'm going to burn my credit, but I'm not going to lose my auto over that. Then if you get in a tougher time, then you lose your auto. But you're like, I'm not losing my house, right? The house and the cell phone bill are usually the last things to go. So there's like an order of importance there. So credit cards, I mean, could that could all of a sudden, if things got rough, unemployment went up, could you see massive defaults on credit cards? Yes. Could that lead to banking problems and, and whatnot? Yes. No. Have you guys ever heard the phrase, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times? Have you ever heard that? If you've never heard that before, you're missing out, okay? It's always a great quote. Well, I have a similar slogan, but it's not in regards to men, it's in regards to credit. Look at this, okay? This is my little saying. Hard times create strong credit profiles. When you go through hard times, right, you're, the only people that are really going to be able to get credit in those hard times are people that are very likely to pay back, right? Now, strong credit profiles create good times because if you're giving credit to only the most probable people to pay back that credit, it's going to create good times overall because the banks aren't going to have to take hits on that and the banks will be able to loan more and more money out there, right? The credit card companies will be more and more willing to loan more money because they're looking out there and like, man, everybody's paying their credit card bills. This is great, right? So for instance, I mean, I remember back in the day, it was, you know, when I, when I had to get even my first auto loan, even though I had a really good stable job and whatnot, I still had, a, I think my first auto loan was in, I want to say eight and a half or nine percent. And this was in a time period where the Fed funds rate was at zero. Keep that in mind. The Fed funds rate was at zero. And even though I had a good stable job and I had a bunch, I had already had a good amount of money, five figures in stocks, if not multi five figures in stocks, right? I had more in stocks, I believe, than, I, than the actual car purchase was. They still made me pay a, a pretty hefty, hefty number for that. And so, but once again, stronger credit profiles, those people pay back. I'm never default on any loan ever, right? Always paid all my credit cards back, always paid all my auto loans back and those sorts of things. And so with, when you give people like myself credit and we pay back everything, right? And we build our credits to perfect things, then these banks and these credit companies, they start giving credit to more and more people. And they're more willing to, you know, good times create weak credit profiles because the banks start getting loosey-goosey with who they're going to give credit to, right? And they start giving auto loans to people that, you know, I don't know if they're going to really pay back those auto loans when these same folks would have never been able to get an auto loan back in 2009, 2010, 2011 because they would have been seen as far too risky back then, right? And weak credit profiles create hard times. So when you give a bunch of credit to, let's say, folks that might not pay it back, right? They're not, they're not, they don't have very stable jobs or stable or, or stable, you know, net worth and those sorts of things. And you're just kind of giving, giving loans out there. It's just kind of like, we'll do whatever it takes to get you in the car. And I've seen a lot of that. You see a lot of that on Instagram, some of these profiles of these guys. Oh, I'll get you in a car. No matter what, you know, come down here. I don't care if you got credit. I don't care. You know, bring two pay stubs. Boom. I'll get you in whatever you want. Right. I see a lot of that stuff on Instagram. And it's, it's not good. It's not good, man. The fact that they've getting that easy with, with, you know, giving credit out there, that always ends in bad times, right? And next thing you know, people's vehicles are getting repoed. And, and, and once again, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Somebody's taking a hit on that, right? So after going through all that, you might say, that's it. That's it. We got a market crash coming. It's starting in one to two months. And, and that's that, right? And you could run to that conclusion. But... It's not that simple. Things are a little more nuanced than that, right? So let's think about this for a moment. You've had the bears screaming, the economy's done in 2022. You had them screaming in 2023. You had them screaming it this year. And guess what? The economy was never actually done, right? Unemployment stayed fairly low, actually extremely low compared to any historical standards. The economies kept trucking along. GDP's kept up, right? Companies have still 
been reporting really good earnings in the top of the market, especially those earnings have gone to the moon. Like literally the top of the companies out there are reporting in just in this, look at this past quarter, for instance, these companies are reporting all time records in terms of revenues, in terms of net income, in terms of margins, they look phenomenal, right? And so for three straight years, people have been screaming, economy done, economy done, economy done, and it hasn't been done, right? So now we're gonna go into 2025 and they're gonna be screaming, the economy's gonna get finished again. And then if it doesn't happen in 2025, they're gonna be screaming in 2026. So a lot of people have been banking on the, the, the downfall of the economy for years and it hasn't happened yet. Doesn't mean it's not coming, but it hasn't happened yet, right? And they're going to keep screaming this until we actually get that big down cycle. And that's why sometimes I just like, let's get it freaking done so people will stop screaming it every two seconds, right? Now, the, a, lot of what, a lot of what people didn't account for is the Fed lags. A lot of people thought the economy was going to be done in 2022 because the Fed started, you know, obviously raising rates substantially. You've got to keep in mind, whenever the Fed goes through a height cycle or actually a lowering cycle, it usually takes one to three years before it actually starts to positively or negatively affect the economy, okay? So let's say the Fed starts lowering in September. The absolute earliest it could start positively affecting the economy is about a year after. But its potential, it doesn't start really hitting the economy positively for two to three years. That's why when you saw the Fed lowering interest rates starting at the end of 07 and they lowered considerably in 2008, 2009, it didn't really actually start helping out the economy in any substantial way until you really started getting to 2010, 2011, 2012. There's the Fed lags there, right? That's why when the Fed started raising rates, did inflation get destroyed just automatically? No, it took a long time to bring it down, right? And so that's what people didn't account for. The Fed lags take a while. Now, you guys know I always say housing. If you want to devastate the economy, you got to devastate the new building market. And the reason being is when a home, when I, I always say this, when a home is built, it's the most phenomenal thing for the economy. The amount of jobs that are created from one home being built is off the charts. There's so many different trades that go into that. It is phenomenal, right? From the process of somebody excavating the land and getting the land ready, right? To the process of the foundation going in and then the plumbers all got to come in, the electricians and the, I mean, it is insane. When you just go through your house and you're like, well, some company made money off that, some company made money off that, some company, it's insane, right? And so one of the reasons the economy got devastated so bad is because a new home build market in the great financial crisis got wrecked, right? We got way overbuilt on new builds and it got completely destroyed. So you gotta ask yourself, are we seeing that yet? Well, the good news is basically all the home builders are public companies, so we can see what's going on with their business. Toll Brothers just a few days ago, reported their numbers, right? They're the highest end home builder. So I thought we started at the high end first. You know what they're seeing? 25% up in terms of contracts here recently. You know what they're seeing as far as dollar amounts? 26% up here recently, 11% up on a year over year basis, just very recently in terms of new home sales. And you know what else Toll Brothers said? They said July was great for demand and August is looking great for demand. Okay, so if there's all these New homes, these are going to end up starting to be started, right? Probably the end of this year or in 2025, which means Toll Brothers is going to be building a whole lot of houses out there for the next at least year, year and a half. Because you've got to keep in mind, when you're talking about building a house, it's, it's minimum usually a one-year process to potentially an 18-month process from the time the contract gets signed to actually like the house being finished, right? Century Communities, a big home builder out there. They're a little lower end, right? These, these earnings came out back at the end of July. They increased their 2024 guidance for home sales revenue and deliveries. Their net new home contracts increased 20% year over year. So they're seeing Toll Brothers and Century Communities are both seeing an acceleration. So they're going to be starting a lot more homes over the next few months than they were last year. Their businesses are actually accelerating right now. Lenar, they reported earnings back in June. So we should get their earnings uh, in September, right? New orders increased 19% for them. So guess what? They're gonna be building a whole lot more houses over the next year than they've been building over the last year. D.R. Horton, they reported earnings back in July. Their net sales orders increased 1%. Is that some huge number? No, but it's still more, right? So you're looking at these home builders and their orders are going up, 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 which means they're going to have to build a lot more houses over this next year. 
which means ultimately that's going to be very good for a lot of these trades over this next, we can call it 12 to 18 months, right? And so now what if, what if mortgage rates drop and these businesses even see another uh, level of acceleration? Well, then that gets really tough to devastate the economy if all these dang homes are being built, right? Additionally, you also have to factor in this, the government. The government has a lot of big plans right now going on that are, these plans are hundreds of billions of dollars or trillions of dollars of spend. So we have basically, at the end of 2021, the government signed in this bipartisan infrastructure bill that's rebuilding America, right? We know we have crumbling infrastructure in America. This is something that's been needed to be done for a long time. A lot of our, especially if you go on the East Coast of the United States, right? In Vegas, it's like everything's so new, like everything's nice, right? Arizona, same exact thing, like everything's so new, like the highways are nice, all those sorts of things. You go to the East Coast, you go to cities that have a long history, you've got crumbling bridges, roads, highways, potholes all over the place. I mean, airports that, geez, they look like they're still back in the 1950s. And it's not a great look for us as the United States of America. We're supposed to be the leader of the world in terms of on the economic front. We're supposed to be the richest country in the world, right? And we got infrastructure that's extremely outdated. For, so for the longest time, we needed a big infrastructure bill. Well, we finally got that infrastructure bill, right? And that money's being spent out there in a substantial, substantial way. Now, from my understanding, from kind of what I looked at, it looks like the bulk of this spending is really 2022 through 2027. It looks like it's front half loaded. It's supposed to be about a decade long plan, but it looks like, to me at least, it looks like a front loaded big spend. So we're going to still have so many forced construction jobs in 2025, 2026, that are government basically backed jobs that the money is basically guaranteed there. And that money's going to continue to be spent on all this infrastructure build out, right? And just really, it's not really a build out. It's more like fixing of what we currently have. Now, additionally, we got the government passed another big deal back in 2022, the Inflation Reduction Act, which I don't know if it's actually an Inflation Reduction Act, but whatever, okay? You know, you believe whatever you want to believe. But the moral of the story is that's a massive another spending bill. $891 billion in spending over 10 years. Now, from what I've seen with this, I believe this is a front-loaded spending bill as well. I believe a lot of the spend is going to be really spent over this next, we can call it two or three years, right? So you have huge, and these aren't small, these are huge, like infrastructure bills, like build out. This is more of a build out. This is more of like, let's fix what we got. And this is more of a build out for the future, right? Simultaneously going in, that creates a lot of jobs. And those are basically guaranteed jobs because the government's just going to spend that money and spend that money, right? So that makes it difficult when you got two massive government dealios going through at the same exact time with a housing market that looks to be accelerating rather than decelerating. Okay, that, that's tough. Then we have the big one coming up here in November, right? Both these guys are spenders, both of them. On both sides, both of them are spenders. Now, they might spend on different things, but they're both spenders. If you think either one is going to be like, oh, no, I'm going to stop the spending. <laughs> you don't know them very well then. They're both spenders. So you don't have to worry about them also cutting spending on government side there, right? And also gridlock's likely probable, I would say, regardless of kind of who gets in. So if you were thinking about is either one going to cut spending? No, they're not going to cut spending, right? So that throws... I think a big wrench in this whole situation because that's not really something you saw prior to the great financial crisis. You didn't see the government spending like a drunken sailor on all these infrastructure bills, right? And all this build out and all those sorts of things. Like this is crazy dollar amounts, like crazy dollar amounts. And you didn't see a housing market accelerating in the great financial crisis. The housing market was already starting to collapse back in 07, right? And then it just got worse in 08, worse in 09. Right now we got a housing market accelerating. That's different, right? So those are factors you have to consider. So my opinion, the real danger is if you're betting on only one outcome here. If you're like convinced in your mind, like it's only gonna be a crash or it's only gonna be risk on, here we go, baby. I think that's the big mistake because there's too many factors at play here to be betting on only one outcome. If we had, if we had, let's say folks that were running for office that weren't gonna be big spenders, along with no big infrastructure bills like all these that are going through right now and we had a housing market decelerating rather than accelerating, I would say, I would bet on a crash actually. I'd be probably, 
I'd be betting heavily on a crash if we didn't have all these factors at play here. So, I mean, just what I can't, I can't, I can't say for sure, like, oh, we're, we're, we're crashed because you just had too many factors at play here. So what do you do? Here's what I'm doing. Okay. I'm going to remain heavy, long stocks in real estate. I'm a huge believer in time in the market beats time in the market. Huge believer of that. I've seen it too many times just in my investing history where you could get very scared, you get very concerned, all the market's going to crash, this is going to happen, we're destined because this lines up with this and this happened in the past, so boom, crash. And then it doesn't happen, right? And I've seen other times where people aren't expecting a crash at all and then that happens. And also you got to keep in mind, there's a great saying in the stock market, it's one of the most true sayings, okay? Bull markets are built on pessimism and then they grow on, um, I, I forget the perfect term for it essentially, the bull markets grow on kind of like people still being concerned, like skittish, a little skeptical of this bull market, right? And then they die on euphoria. Well, we just don't feel like this is a euphoric market right now, right? It would be much easier if I saw huge amounts of call buying right now. If I saw everybody out there saying, you know, oh, we're going to the moon, baby. The economy is good. Soft landing guaranteed. If I saw all that, I'd be able to say much easier, like, oh, this is the end. Like, like you know, because bull markets die on optimism. Look at 2021. It died on optimism, right? Look at 2007. You had a lot of optimism there. Look at the tech bubble. We don't really have that. We have it a market at all-time highs, but the market sets all-time highs almost every year. Like, it's a very common phenomenon unless you went through a crash, Right. So you can't really just say that. You got there's a, a certain feeling, there's certain data points, and it's it's hard to really make that that you know statement about that. I'm going to keep buying growth, value, dividend stocks weekly. I've been leaning very heavy to value and dividend stocks recently, rather than growth stocks, and I'm going to continue to be heavy in profit companies that make a lot of money because these sorts of I want to be in the sorts of companies that they do well regardless. Inflation, deflation. Bad economy, good economy, okay economy. I want to be heavy in those sorts of companies that are, they perform, they put up their numbers regardless, right? And if you look at where my big money's focused, those companies put up their numbers regardless. Like, it doesn't matter what's going on. Oh, these companies are all facing weakness. These companies are doing great, right? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to also hold about, I would say probably between $500,000 and $1.5 million of cash in 2025. And I'm going to still be able to earn 4 to 5% range in 2025. Because you've got to understand when the Fed does start lowering, and it's going to take them a while to get rates down. It's going to take them a while. So I'm going to still likely be able to earn either through high-yield CDs, high-yield savings accounts, or treasuries. I'll still likely be able to yield probably 4 to 5%. Maybe toward the very end of 2025, like the fourth quarter, I might... You know, I might only be able to get like 3% or something like that. But for now, like this is the best it's ever been. Like for my generation, the millennial generation, we never got to see rates of of 4 to 5% at the bank, right? And so right now, high yield, you get that sort of numbers. Treasuries, you get those sorts of numbers right now. So I'm going to continue to hold a good amount of cash and have that cash earn interest. I love to see it. I mean, it's beautiful when you could make, you know, $1,000 plus a month if not multi-thousand dollars, just by holding money in high-yield savings or in a CD account. It's a lot of fun. (laughs) It's a lot of dang fun, right? Now, additionally, I'm going to hedge going into 2025. I'm going to hedge probably somewhere between $50,000 and $75,000. Remember, when I hedge, I'm going to go smaller. Because when when I'm hedging, it doesn't take a lot of money to make a huge difference. Like, if if we do get into some sort of situation where, let's say in 2025, the S&P 500 sells off 25%, right? Gosh, the amount of money my hedges would print. Like if I put fifty thousand dollars into some hedges and I properly hedge, right, the fifty thousand could grow into a quarter million to three hundred thousand, right? If you talked about a big downward move in the market, so that's kind of my cover in my backside, just in case, just in case. Maybe it is the the next GFC, and if it is, whew, I'll make a lot of money on that. And guess what? Then the SP five hundred goes down twenty five percent plus, right? All of a sudden, I made a profit of, let's say, a quarter million dollars. Then I got an extra quarter mil I can now put in the market as stocks at extremely low prices. Now, let's say everything's fine. Everything goes up, 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 up. Sweet. That's fine with me as well because the 50000 I risked, let's say, in hedges, ends up being a very small amount compared to how much I gain in my longs because my long portfolios might be up a half million dollars on the year, a million dollars, $1.5 million, depending upon how 
well those positions do, right? So 50,000 out of that's nothing. <laughs> you know, so that's kind of the way I think about that as well. And then additionally, um, I mean, here's what I'll say, okay? You can't control what stock prices do. You can't control whether stock prices are going to crash next year, whether they're going to go up, anything like that. But what you can control is if you're building your portfolio each year, right? That's what you can control. You can control your income versus your expenses. Those are sorts of things that are controllables. There's, I, ju I just laid you out a case. I just laid you out a whole case there, an entire case, the most in-depth case you'll ever see from any YouTube channel out there. I laid you out a whole case on why this could be GFC 2.0, right? And I laid you out a whole other case on why this might not be GFC 2.0, right? And why we got a lot of different dynamics going on right now. They need to be considered. A lot of times people want to assume this period's like that period. These periods are very different. And there's a lot of different factors at play, right? And so the truth is no one can really predict accurately if next year is going to be a market crash or not. They're throwing darts at a dartboard because you're not getting a clear enough signal either way right now. And so you're just kind of taking a gamble if you think it's going to be all full risk on or if it's going to be full risk off. And so, you know, you can control building your portfolio. So that's what I'll remain focused on next year, right? Building out my portfolio is what I remain focused on this year. Every single week, build my positions. There's great opportunities in the market all over the place. It doesn't matter if you're in a bull market, a bear market, a kangaroo market. There's going to be opportunities out there, right? And in a, let's say we got into a super bearish market. Value stocks will hold up better than that. Dividend stocks will hold up better because people will say, gosh, I can't make any money from stocks appreciating right now. It would be great to make some dividend money. And keep in mind, if stock prices do go down in any significant way, what happens? Dividend yields go up, right? Stock prices go down, dividend yields come up. Great companies can keep paying out bigger and bigger dividends, which is phenomenal. And so you see actually a move into a lot of the value and dividend stocks. So if you're GVD, like I am, growth value dividends, you're going to see some nice appreciation there. Additionally, where do people like to position? They also like to position into the best positions possible, which would be the top of the market, the meta stocks, the Amazons, you know, those sorts of stocks I'm obviously very invested in. So those ones could continue to do very well in that sort of market, which get, makes it hard to get that market down, right? Additionally, if you had big economic worries out there, then you could have companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, right? Saying, you know what? We're, we're a little worried about the economy. So in 2026, we're going to pull back on our AI spend in quite a significant way. I could tell you Wall Street might like some of that pullback on, on spend, right? Because these companies are spending ridiculous amounts of money. And then those companies said, you know, we're going to use some of that money we were spending on AI, we're going to, uh, on chips. We're going to use that to do buybacks. That wouldn't be great for NVIDIA stock. Let's be clear about that. But for those other stocks, people might actually look at that as a great thing, right? Because these companies are spending immense amount of money on that. So it's another factor to kind of keep in there, right? So you, is you as an investor, don't just bet on one outcome. Understand there's a lot of different things that can play out here. And, uh, you know, if you're trying to sell out of your entire portfolio and you're like, I'm going to buy back because it's all going to crash, you know, you could be right, but I'm just setting, you're, you're setting yourself up so much risk. If you're saying, I'm going all in, I'm margin and baby, it's risk on, you're setting yourself up so much risk. If things go the other way and it doesn't go the way you're thinking of, oh my gosh. If you're like, I'm going to go heavy put options, if that big crash doesn't come right now, oh my gosh, you're going to set up for yourself for 100% losses on those put positions and things like that, guys. So focus on building out your overall portfolio. Let everything else be what it's going to be, okay? Appreciate you guys being here as always. If you're looking to get around like-minded investors like myself and many others, we got a thousand plus members in my private stock group, my private wealth group, and uh, you also get to learn everything I got up here. You get access to 1000xstocks.com if you want access to all those sorts of things. Pin comment down there, click on that. You can fill out an application. We'll see if we can get you in there and access to all that next week. Much love and have a great day.